All right, so this is Stephen Palmer with Perry Brass, and this is May 18th, 2018, and we're in Perry's apartment, Perry and his husband's apartment. Yes. Um, and we are here uh, to do an interview about the Stonewall Project, for the Stonewall Project, and we're gonna do, um, I'm gonna ask some questions, not exactly rapid fire, but to get into childhood okay. and so on, so that we could unfold a little bit more quickly to the matter at hand, which okay. is those years. Yes, okay. of course. So if you could take some time and talk about um, what year you were born and where you grew up and what your family life was like and religion and sure. siblings and so on, go ahead. I'd be happy to. Uh, I was born uh, on September 15th, 1947. I'm an Ur Virgo. <laughs> uh, I uh, like to tell people that I grew up belonging to four separate and often mutually exclusionary groups. I grew up uh, as a uh, Southern, I grew up Southern, Jewish, impoverished, and gay very much gay. I mean, like by the time I was certainly 12 or 13, I realized that I had uh, these crushes on boys. Uh, 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 my father died uh, when I was 11 years old. My mother, I'm, I'm sorry, I was 11 years old. My sister was nine years old and my mother was 34 years old, uh, which meant that uh, she was left at the age of 34 with two children and absolutely no money. Uh, he died of, uh, well, I was told that he died, he had died of kidney problems, uh, and he died just totally bankrupt. I mean, in fact, calling it bankrupt would be beyond bankrupt. Uh, he'd been sick for a while, uh, and he'd had several uh, terrible uh, business losses. I mean, he, uh, he was like me. He had no uh, uh, mind for money at all. Uh, he was a wonderful man. Uh, he was very much a kind of a southern Jewish gentleman uh, who could speak fluent Yiddish and had a southern accent and was very open to people. He had black friends. He had a lot of friends who weren't Jewish. Uh, he liked, he was very southern. He liked what they call in the south hunting and fishing. Uh, uh, when he died, he had 13 uh, guns in the house. Uh, and uh, he uh, never ever made me feel that I was a disappointment to him. Uh, I hated guns. I hated fishing. I thought fishing was boring and guns were violent. Uh, he, when I was about maybe seven years old, he took me out shooting with him. And as soon as the guns started going off, uh, uh, we went out into the woods to shoot little animals. And as soon as the guns went off, I started throwing up. I couldn't take it. I, I hated the noise and I hated the whole thing. And he just took me aside and he said, you never have to do this again. I'm never going to do this again with you. You don't ever have to do this again. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, he encouraged me to have the imagination that I uh, grew up with. Uh, I, I was involved with puppets and reading and stories, and, and he encouraged all of that. He, uh, he brought me books to read. Uh, uh, he... Uh, uh, I started making puppets when I was uh, about probably seven years old. He brought me books on puppetry and built a puppet stage for me. Uh, and uh, my mother uh, loathed all that. Uh, she wanted me to be like a regular boy. Uh, and her story, I'll get into her story in a couple of minutes. Uh, so uh, we were, uh, after he died, we were thrown into this, I mean, total level of poverty. We, uh, we moved into a public housing project in Savannah, Georgia, where we were the only Jewish family in the project. And the project uh, took up, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 acres of land and it had streets in it and all this. And I couldn't walk down the streets without, you know, these kids who were, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I can just characterize them as mostly rednecks. They would start shouting at me things like, hey, queer, and hey, sissy, and hey, Jew, queer, and things like that. Uh, and uh, so growing up there uh, was very hard hell for me. Uh, but in the, um, in the uh, sixth grade, I had a teacher who decided that I was a gifted child. Uh, 
I had uh, a very high reading level. Uh, I had no math level at all. I, I have no math abilities. A lot of that is just uh, math phobia. But uh, I had a very high reading level. In the sixth grade, I was probably reading on a, almost a college level. Uh, so she had me uh, put into gifted kid programs. And uh, uh, I was with the same kids in these gifted kid programs all the way through high school so that I had this group of friends who were all the way through high school with me. Uh, and many of them were Jewish. I mean, like probably half the kids in the program were Jewish in Savannah, Georgia, where Jews consisted of 1% of the population. Uh, so they were very protective of me in many ways. So I went through high school uh, not being so horribly bullied as a lot of later gay kids would be because I had this, this group of, of gifted kids who protected me, uh, many of whom were Jewish. Uh, uh, my uh, mother's story was that uh, uh, right after my father died, uh, she had a, like a complete breakdown, uh, so it seemed, and she was hospitalized and sent into a, a mental hospital for about uh, two or three months. And after that, uh, she was always in and out and back in uh, mental facilities. Uh, and uh, I... Uh, as long as I was there to kind of protect her and be almost her parent and be mommy's little helper, it was fine. Uh, and I, I was always going to be this. Uh, my sister refused to be in that role. She, she would not be in that role. And uh, when uh, I was 14, she had another major breakdown and was hospitalized again. And we were sent off to live with relatives. And then when she came out of the hospital, uh, she and I went through this period of extreme antagonism uh, where uh, I decided that uh, I was no longer going to be mommy's little helper. I was going to be like a regular boy. Uh, and uh, uh, this just exploded. And when I was 15, uh, uh, I basically tried, well, I, I did, I tried to kill myself. Uh, and when I uh, came out of that, when I woke up at the ho in the hospital after taking you know, several bottles of her pills, I very soon came to an epiphany in my life. And that was that I was never going to let anyone, like my mother, drive me to suicide again. And I was going to be the person that I was meant to be. And this was something for a 15-year-old boy to decide this. The next year was my senior year in high school. And uh, I became an extremely popular kid in my high school. I had this total attitude. It was that if anybody bugged me, fuck them. I would just, I would just, I ignored them. I walked through the halls, you know, with this complete attitude. And all these kids, uh, the ones who were not my friends in the gifted kid program, but the other kids who, you know, sometimes had done terrible things to me and you know, started rumors about me, stuff like that, shit like that. I uh, just snubbed them, and they started thinking, oh, my God, Brass has got something we, we don't know about and we want. So they all started coming over to me. Uh, and uh, the next year, I went off to college. And I went off to the University of Georgia uh, like a couple of weeks before I was uh, 17. So I was still a kid. And at that point, uh, the... The University of Georgia was this huge uh, kind of southern uh, redneck school, very redneck, very southern. Uh, I th it had been integrated like two years earlier. Uh, you might have remembered Charlene Hunter Galt. She was the first black person to go to the University of Georgia. She integrated. So they had like 30 black kids in like 14,000 white kids. Uh, so. Uh, I had a lot of shit there. I mean, I had death threats in my dorm room. Uh, uh, I was an art student. For what? Uh, for being queer. I mean, it was like they just decided that I was gay. And I, I had come out. I mean, I knew I was gay. I knew this was all a front, that I'd have to do all this crap to hide it. And I had some friends of mine who were left over from the Gifted Kid program in Savannah who were at Georgia. and. They kind of knew what was going on, uh, but uh, I decided that uh, 
I was going to leave there. I was going to leave fucking Georgia. And it, at the end of that year, at 17, I hitchhiked from Savannah to San Francisco. I'd heard that San Francisco was just crawling with queers, and I was going to find out what was going on. So just going back a few years, yeah. um, with the, the suicide attempt, yeah. um, you had decided you're just going to be who, who you are yes. without any fronts. Yes. At that point, did that include being gay? And yes. Then, okay. Yes. Um, was that the primary thrust of what you were talking about? That um, Yes, okay. that was it. Okay. Yeah, okay. that was it. That was it. Um, when your uh, father was very encouraging of you earlier on, yeah. do you think he sensed that you were gay? Hard, it's hard to imagine. I mean, I, he died when I was 11. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, I mean, he, he knew that I wasn't like other kids. But he had been not like other people also. Mm -hmm. I mean, he... He uh, had fought in World War II. He had these Coke bottle thick glasses. He had terrible eyesight. And he told me when he was a kid, he'd been uh, called four eyes. And, uh, you know, he, he, reali he knew what it was like to be uh, hurt as a, you know, as a kid. So uh, he uh, was very sympathetic towards me. You know, I, I always tell people I have no bad memories of my father, no good ones of my mother, which is not very fair, but that's the way that is. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but you, but there's another go. story about my mother, which is also very interesting, uh, and that is that uh, my mother was a lesbian. And uh, the fact that she was a lesbian uh, uh, in the South growing up, I mean, I mean you know, in, this, in this environment, was extremely difficult for her. Uh, and the fact that, uh, I think the fact that uh, he, she realized she was a lesbian, and then, so what does she do? She produces, you know, this queer son. Uh, so uh, later on, she, she came out, I mean, like, uh, by the time I was uh, about 20, certainly by the time I was 21, she was openly living with a woman. And she was, you know, fairly open about being a lesbian. Uh, no, maybe by the time I was 23. Anyway, she was fairly open about that, but it didn't bring us any closer together. It never brought us closer together. Yeah. Um, and I, I believe you had a story, an early um, sexual uh, realization story, some <clears throat> teenage that you would like to tell. Um, you were mentioning that when we were talking on the phone that there was um, uh, some sex capade uh, that you had when you were a teenager mm -hmm. with somebody? Did I get that wrong? No, I don't think I remember that. Okay, okay. Yeah. Sure enough. I don't remember that. Um, so we're in the early 60s now, yeah. like 1960, when you're in uh, University of Savannah, University uh, probably of, around 63? 60? No, that, that was in 64, 65, when 60. I was at, at the University of Georgia, yeah. And the, at what year did you hitch out to San Francisco? In June of 65. June of 65. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Talk about San Francisco, June of 65. Well, uh, it, what happened was uh, I uh, left the South with a canvas suitcase and about $70 in my pocket. So I got to San Francisco, and uh, it was... Uh, uh, fabulous, very difficult, but amazing. Uh, and the fact that uh, uh, there was a gay world there. Could be two. One going one direction, one going the other. We might end up having to stop a lot. Well, unfortunately, it's now rush hour, okay. so there are more trains. Yeah. Okay. Would it help us if we closed those doors at all? Um, no. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Why was San Francisco fabulous in June of 16? Well, I mean, it, it had, there was a, like a gay world there. Uh, I mean, they had bars, they had, uh, 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 it was still very underground. Uh, I mean, uh, the, like the, the straight San Francisco did not want to even acknowledge gay San Francisco. Uh, but uh, being a young man there, and I was 18 years old there, uh, uh, I got a lot of attention, obviously. When you're 18 years old, you get a lot of attention. And I was very good looking and, uh, and realized that uh, uh, this was very nice. Uh, and I was very much looking for, I wanted love. I really did. Uh, I was very romantic. And uh, I was very romantic on one hand, and then on the other hand, uh, very insecure. I did, you know, like I had no money. I had, uh, it was, uh, I, I had several jobs there. Uh, they were really terrible jobs. Uh, and uh, I made a lot of friends. It was easy to make friends, and I had gay friends, which was just unimaginable, you know, to do that in the South, especially at that time. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I, got, I got involved in uh, the kind of underground world of San Francisco, this world of hustlers and drag queens and uh, bull dykes and... Uh, as, you know, and here I am. I was 18 years old from the South with a heavy Southern accent, and there I am in this, in this kind of uh, uh, John Ritchie, Fellini world. Uh, and uh, Do you remember what part of San Francisco you were hanging around in at that time? Yes, of course. Well, I was living in a hotel in the Tenderloin that was this rundown hotel. I like to describe it as, it was like some hotel in a 1930s English movie, uh, you know, with worn carpeting and uh, 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 mice all over the place. And uh, the the landlady at the, uh, the hotel uh, was a, um, a woman I, I uh, I think her name was Mrs. Cook, and her son was a hustler. Uh, and, uh, you know, things were amazingly open. Uh, in a, I mean, they weren't like in your face open, but people acknowledged that this, this was the world there. Uh, uh, and uh, I went to some, you know, uh, I went to some bars there to have to sneak into bars. But a lot of my uh, uh, socializing, my, my gay life, was uh, uh, centered around a place that was behind the Gilded Cage. And if you lived in San Francisco or, or, or any of that time, the Gilded Cage was a very famous gay bar that was, uh, had a, a drag show uh, that starred a fabulous drag queen named Charles Pierce. And uh, in the back of the Gilded Cage, they had opened a coffee house for the kids. Uh, for people under 21 to go to called Pearls. And Pearls opened at one o'clock in the morning on the weekends. And so I'd go to Pearls uh, uh, on the weekends and uh, I'd have to take a nap to do it, you know, because uh, I had a regular nine to five job, so I'd take a nap and then I'd go to Pearls. And uh, there were all these other gay kids there. I mean, like, you know, hundreds, you know, easily. I mean, a couple of hundred gay kids would be in Pearls. And then, of course, you'd have, you'd have gay kids, and then you'd have the older guys, you know, wanting you know, go, to go after them, uh, what we would call chicken queens. Uh, although some of them were not all that, you know, all that old. I mean, you know, some of them were like maybe 27, and they're, they're looking for 19-year-old kids. Uh, and I had uh, certainly had several boyfriends in that period uh, that I'd met at Pearls. Uh, but I, uh, I got very tired of... Uh, well, A, virtually starving because I was paid nothing with the jobs I had and finding jobs in San Francisco was so difficult. So uh, I uh, decided to come to the East Coast and uh, to make... And I, 
I'm just going to let you know a question I'm going to ask you at San Francisco before you leave. Yeah. Uh, if you knew of Jose Saria. Oh, yes. And, um, yes. And the performer Michelle. No, didn't know Michelle, but I, I knew Very Jose. Scary. I met Jose. Uh, and, uh, uh, yes, I met Jose, uh, and I met Jose in a really fabulously interesting story about meeting Jose. Uh, uh, one day, uh, one night, I should say, one night I was out on Market Street and there was this area uh, that uh, was filled with some snack bars and, uh, uh, yeah, like uh, hot dog places and stuff like that. And uh, it was on Market Street near Powell, a famous corner of Market and Powell. So I was there one evening, maybe about seven or eight o'clock and uh, uh, Jose uh, uh, arrived with this other gentleman uh, and uh, they kind of introduced themselves to me, uh, and which, which made a lot of sense. I mean, like people came up to me and talked to me all the time. Uh, and uh, Jose told me all about himself, that he had been, uh, you know, like the empress of the black cat and the black cat had closed maybe two, three years before this happened, uh, but he was very nice, really very courtly kind of guy. So he was with this other guy, who was uh, who'd ran a, who who ran a hustler service, and he tried to uh, recruit me for the hustler service, and um, I just was not into him, was not into what he wanted, and so Jose said to me and to this other guy, he said. Well, maybe Perry is interested in something else besides that, which was he understood that uh, I was not interested in that life. Uh, uh, and uh, I think that was the only time that I met him, was that one time. Uh, but he was very sweet, uh, and uh, you know, I'll never forget that. Yeah. So um, why did you decide to come to the East Coast? Well, I was you know, as I said, tired of starving in San Francisco, and I literally, I virtually was, I mean, uh, and uh, I bombed out of a couple of jobs, uh, and uh, I uh, met, had met someone who lived in Hartford, Connecticut, and at that point, Hartford was booming because it was a munitions town. Uh, there were all these munitions factories, and Pratt & Whitney Aircraft was there. Uh, so, uh, uh, he said, why don't you come to Hartford? You can find a job there. So I did. I, I moved to Hartford. I think that's a bird. <laughs> yeah. Is the door open? Is that there? Yeah. You mind? Maybe they're closing the door to open the train as well. Yeah. I didn't know. Oh, the, the door to the balcony is open? Yeah. Oh, love, if we close that, it'll make a difference. Oh, this front door? Oh, but the, the door to the balcony is closed? That's good. Yeah. Okay. It's just the front door. Okay. I could go on. Is there like a second door that closes? Is there a second door that closes? Yeah. Did you make it up to the hate at all? I know that was yes. just fledgling. But. Yeah, yeah. The, the hate then was, uh, uh, it was kind of marvelous, the hate then. The place that was really scary, though, was, um, the Castro. The Castro was still a really rough working class area. Yeah. Eureka Valley. Yeah. Irish Catholic. Yeah, it was a rough working class area. But the hate, by the time I got to San Francisco, the hate was marvelous. I mean, they had a lot of things going there. Uh, they, uh, oh, they had the, um, God, what is the, that rock? Um, they had the Fillmore. I mean, the Fillmore was there. Uh, Do you go to the Fillmore in uh, San Francisco? No, I never got to there. Yeah. How about the Avalon? Yes, I went there once. Yes, I went there once. God, it was so fucking druggy. <laughs> I think I just couldn't take it. It was just because I didn't, I didn't smoke dope. You know, I mean, there, you know, but I have a whole 
how, all sorts of stories about that. About yeah. Where did you? Who did you see at the Avalon Ballroom? I can't remember. I cannot remember. I just remember that it was, the, it was so druggy. Yeah. What did you think of? Um, because counterculture does come into the story. What did you think of the? You know. Um, the hippies, the hippie the, counterculture starting, and what that looked like. I had several friends who were involved with that, uh, and uh, and some of them were panhandlers also, like they they make money panhandling, uh, and uh, I I didn't think a whole lot of it at that point. I really didn't uh, because uh, I was still much more intellectual. I mean, like I liked to read. I was very involved with reading and uh, I was painting and writing and I thought that uh, they had just dropped out to nothing. Uh, so uh, I, that was just, it was like part of the world of San Francisco, but it was part of another world. And it wasn't part of the gay world of San Francisco, which was much more uh, either uh, kind of gutter drag or trying to be really bourgeois. Uh, yeah. The sweater queens, yeah. somebody yeah. once said to me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, one of the places, the bars that I, I did go to was a place called The Rendezvous, which uh, was known as the Wax Museum of San Francisco because guys would go there and just sort of stand and pose. Uh, but since I was this kid and I had to sneak in, there'd be like this, this you know, army of good-looking gay guys there and uh, when I would walk in there'd always be like five or six of them who wanted to meet me so uh, it wasn't that bad. Uh, there were a whole bunch of other places that I went to. The though. Capri? I don't remember the Capri. Janice uh, used to hang out there yeah, in Joplin. Yeah, uh, don't remember. Or Maud's? Yes, I went there. Yeah, God, wow. I haven't thought about that in a long Up time. Up on uh, Cole Street. Yes, I haven't thought about that in a long time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll move it into New York and yeah. uh, the scene there. Yeah. So uh, I stayed in Hartford for about, uh, about maybe five months. And then I realized that I really wanted to be in New York. And uh, I was accepted into Cooper Union's night school. Uh, uh, which had something like, uh, I think they had 300 applicants and 15 places. Uh, so uh, I moved to New York, and uh, I moved to New York in uh, August of 1966, one month before my 19th birthday. Uh, and as I tell people, I had no money, no family, and no education. Uh, <laughs> it's like walking around with a huge sign that says, Pussy, fuck this. I mean, it was just, it was, you know, I mean, to be uh, that green in New York. Uh, but people were really nice to me. I will say that. I mean, for the most part, I mean, I had, like any other kid, uh, dealing with, you know, a, a, a big, impersonal city. And I think New York at that point was uh, much rougher than, uh, certainly than it is now. Much rougher, uh, I described it as a city of uh, class, race, uh, uh, ethnic, and you know, cl class, race, and ethnic resentment. It was like everybody resented everybody else. I mean, there was this huge level of resentment. Uh, and uh, it was extremely segregated. I mean, uh, I think that New York was probably more segregated than Atlanta, Georgia at that point. Uh, so, uh, uh, it was difficult for me. I mean, it, it was really, really, I was still very Southern. I still had Southern manners. Uh, the, a lot of people in New York were just absolutely charmed by that. I mean, that I had a, a deep Southern accent. I still had very Southern manners. Uh,
this, this, it will be over with in a little while, I, I think, pretty much, yeah. Rush hour is from five to seven, usually. Yeah, it's around that. Yeah. Uh, There's all of these divisions in New York City and... Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, <coughs> And also the uh, the gay life in New York, which uh, I just jumped right into. I was it was so much I would say harder edged than San Francisco. It really was. How uh, people were more uh, they weren't. It was hard to be nice. Let's just put it like a. You still had entrapment in the bars. You had raids in the bars. You didn't really have that in San Francisco, at least I think that by the time I got to San Francisco, the mafia was not so embedded in the bars in San Francisco as it was in New York. I mean, but, uh, but there were those two experiences in San Francisco, the Compton raids, yes. and there was also yeah. um, the um, um, religions coming out for homosexuals right. at California right. Hall. Yes, yes, I, I know about events. that. Yeah, yeah. But, but nonetheless, yes. But I, I just felt that uh, that New York, uh, people were just harder. Uh, they, there was a harder edge to it, uh, and ruder. And uh, and like I said, I was a I was a Southern kid in New York, so my first feelings. It, it took me about five years to really feel integrated into New York. I mean, before that, I had this kind of uh, chip on my shoulder attitude about the place, which was really stupid. I mean, I could look back on it because people were so nice to me. I mean, I got uh, amazing jobs, considering that I had a background of nothing. I had had one year at the University of Georgia studying fine arts, uh, but I got I had amazing jobs. Uh, people were very sweet to me, for the most part. I, I met my first lover when I was 19, and he was a wonderful guy. Where did you live? Uh, I was living then in the East Village, uh, and, and then uh, when I met uh, uh, Dick, my first lover, and then uh, I, uh, I went to Europe when I was 21, and it was another Perry Brass story. I think I arrived in Europe with like $70 in my pocket and spent three months there. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, when I came back, uh, uh, I managed to score an amazing apartment in Hell's Kitchen. Uh, it was a fourth floor walk up, but four room apartment and the rent was something like $68 a month. Mm. So uh, I described it as my Guggenheim grant. Uh, and uh, I was living there uh, in Hell's Kitchen when Stonewall happened. Uh, and I was 21 uh, when that happened. Uh, and uh, the two nights of Stonewall, I was not at the Stonewall. I was around the corner. I was at a bar called Julius's both nights. Uh, and someone came into Julius's, rushed into Julius's and said, the girls are rioting in Stonewall. So I thought, okay. Uh, and. Uh, I kept hearing about other things going on around the corner of the stone wall, and finally uh, I went out and saw what was going on. Uh, and by that time, the cops had put out riot lights. There were I mean, cops in uh, riot helmets all over the place, uh, and I saw, uh, you know, the glass on the streets and uh, uh, the uh, just the, the whole. Actually, I w it was like an, it was like a theatrical event. That's what it really looked like. Uh, it was like it was like theater. But there was so much political theater going on then that uh, you almost sort of took it in stride. Uh, that's something that people uh, have a hard time understanding. That when Stonewall happened, there were so many what we called actions then going on that if GLF had not been founded. And if there'd been no political organization organizing after Stonewall, then the Stonewall situation would have been simply another, another action. Uh, it would have been like uh, youth against war and fascism marching through uh, Washington Square Park. Uh, it would have been like, uh, uh, you know, God knows how many anti-war pickets, anti-war rallies. Uh, uh, 
it, it would just, you had to have the connection with this event and the political organization that happened afterwards to produce the modern gay movement. Can we back up just a little bit then sure. and talk about where you were politically in terms of um, um, the Vietnam War, um, um, the civil rights movement, what your thoughts sure. about? Sure, great, very good, okay. Uh, I was hugely against the Vietnam War uh, and I got out of the draft because I uh, boy, I was going to say, they used to have an expression called checking the box. Boy, I not only checked the box, I went out there with a, you know, fucking bass drum. Uh, and uh, this happened to me when I lived, in, when I was living in Connecticut. I was going to be drafted at 18. I thought, I, I said, no way in hell if I can not have this happen to me. Because I'd already taken ROTC in high school and at the University of Georgia. It, I don't know if you are familiar with ROTC, Reserve Officers Training Corps, mm -hmm. but in, this, in southern schools, that's a big thing. You know, all boys are supposed to be involved in ROTC. And some of the dumbest men I'd ever met in my life were instructors for ROTC. I mean, these sergeants who could barely chew gum and walk. And I thought, I do not want one of these guys over me. I mean, I was 18 years old and a gay rebellious kid, and I was not going to you know, let that happen. So uh, I had no compunctions at all about checking the box. I'd been told, oh, this will ruin you, it'll destroy your life, you'll never be able to do anything, you'll never be able to teach, you'll never be blah, blah, blah. And I still thought, no, I'm not going to do that. Just elaborate on checking the box a little bit. Well, yes, I mean, it, it, it was a box that said homosexual tendencies. Uh, and I went to my, uh, when I went for my uh, draft induction, uh, I had to, uh, have a little interview and this guy, uh, he looked at my uh, 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 enlistment uh, questionnaire and he said, what about these homo tendencies? Do you still have them? And I said, yes. And he said, well, what are you going to do about them? I swear, he said, what are you going to do about them? And I, I said, I'm just going to keep on having them, you ass. I didn't say you asshole, but I, I mean, the whole idea is like, you know, you know, when, when you're working with people who are that stupid, what do you do? Are you going to keep having that? Oh, yeah, right, right, yeah, sure. So I decided, I, I decided that you know, I had to say something to kind of floor them. So I told them, I swear, this is the quote. I said to them, I said, well, I said, I'd moved to San Francisco and I became fixated there. <laughs> and he just looked at me and he said, oh, I see. <laughs> I, you know, here I am, 18 years old. So, uh, they, what they did was they, they stamped my draft papers, rejected. You know, they have rejected me. Not that I have rejected them, but they have rejected me. So, uh, I felt about the Vietnam War that uh, uh, this was a war we hadn't even officially declared yet. Uh, and, uh, I mean, I, I knew things about it, I read stuff about it. And I realized uh, this was just horrible. I wasn't going to end up coming back in a body bag for this war that wasn't even a declared war yet. Uh, my uh, uh, mother uh, spoke to my uh, this guy who had been our uh, our doctor in Savannah, and she said something like to him, "Well, can you write some sort of note to get Perry out of the draft?" <laughs> and uh, uh, our doctor, who was uh, this. Uh, really uh, conservative Southern Jewish guy who uh, had separate waiting rooms in his practice, he said, oh, no, it'd be good for Perry to be drafted. It'll make a man out of him. And I, th I mean, I, I hated this man. I thought after I heard this, I said I, I even hated him more. Uh, separate waiting rooms. Yes, for black people and white people, yes. I mean, they still had separate waiting rooms then. They had separate waiting rooms. They had separate water fountains. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, they had separate bathrooms, of course. You had separate bathrooms if black people actually had a bathroom. I mean, if you were black to find a bathroom in the South, was just... Uh... I'm going to ask you to speak a little bit about what your sense of those racial divisions were, how that, how that affected you, what your feelings about that were at the time. Oh, okay. Let the train yep. I'm just getting a development yep. to 
yeah. political consciousness. Sure, yeah. Well, I hated it. Uh, I hated it very early. I became aware of what was going on probably by the time I was about nine or ten years old. Uh, what, did, what do you remember? I, I, I just realized that uh, the way black people were treated uh, was just horrible. It was really just horrible. Uh, and uh, being Jewish helped. I mean, the, uh, the, there were really progressive Southern Jews, and uh, some of them were my friends, or the, uh, their children were my friends. And uh, they hated what was going on. There were conservative Southern Jews who, uh, you know, they thought that what was going on was the way it should have been going on. That uh, they were, the joke about Southern Jews is that they're Southern first and Jews second. And you, uh, I knew a lot of um, a lot of Jews like that, uh, but the fact that I was a Jew in the South, and you know, and we were working class. I mean, my father's a working class man. Uh, uh, it meant that uh, I could see right offhand kind of life in a much more unvarnished way, and uh, I just I hated it. Uh, I really hated it. I really did. Uh, one of the things that I, I understood about uh, about growing up there was that most of what was like uh, acceptable by polite society was simply a lie. It was just a lie. And that helped me being gay. It's too bad this thing is so, it's so sensitive. I mean, it makes sense. It, Maybe one day they'll be able to get something where it's just the direct yeah. line and all the ambient noise yeah. goes out. I mean, normally you need it. How do I want to have to boom pull and drift it down? Yeah. You can still hear. Yeah, I understand. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I, I, I wanted yeah. to get. Yeah. So my, my mother uh, was uh, much more uh, influenced by uh, Southern stupidity. I mean, uh, she had a whole thing about, you know, like uh, what Schwarzes were like, and uh, that's a Yiddish word for black people, uh, and that they were in fear, they were just sort of marked with inferi inferiority. Uh, and I, I really just hated that. I, I really did not like that. And my father was not like that. Uh, my, my father had black friends, and uh, he, uh, he was much more accepting of people. He really was. And I admired that in him. Sounds like a theme with him, right? Yes. Um, so we're in New York. I'd like you to describe um, the sounds, the sights, the smells of Greenwich Village at the time. Um, how people were with one another, what it looked like. You know, close your mind. But however you'd like to do that. Well, it was... Uh... It was certainly more real. I mean, like there were still real artists in you know walk-up apartments, and one of the things I remember so beautifully was hearing piano pianos being uh, practiced because you'd you'd have all these musicians, you know, up you know upstairs like third and fourth floor apartments with their windows open practicing pianos, you know, practicing the piano, let's say on you know on Bank Street or on uh, Waverly Place, uh, and if you went there like in a spring or summer evening, you would hear people uh, practicing the piano, you'd hear singers singing. Uh, so there was this feeling that there were real artists there, uh, and there were wonderful restaurants that you know, didn't cost an arm and a leg. Uh, there was a wonderful gay restaurant called The Finale uh, that uh, Dick Farnsworth, my, my first lover, he took me to. And uh, this was pre-Stonewall. Uh, uh, there were a number of gay restaurants in the village then. Uh, the idea of the gay restaurant uh, had taken off. Uh, I mean, uh, it's hard to imagine, like, uh, especially for younger people.
it's hard to imagine for younger people why you would want to go to a quote gay restaurant but in those days uh, if you were uh, a, a male couple it was hard to even get a, a table at a restaurant if you were four gay men it was almost impossible I mean you would not be given a table if you walked up to let's say the maitre d and there are four of you he'd say I'm sorry this, well, we have nothing for you uh, even if you had reservations, they'd lose the reservation. And this was really common. Uh, I had a uh, boyfriend who lived on the Upper East Side at that point. And uh, I remember one night he had two friends there and they were looking for places to go out and eat. And I, I know there, God knows there must have been 60 restaurants within four block. And they said, well, we can go here, we can go here, we can go here, we can go here. And I said, why can't we go other places? And he said, because you won't be able to get, we won't be able to get a table. They will just not seat four men at a table. Uh, so uh, you had these wonderful gay restaurants. Uh, there weren't a whole lot of bars then. Uh, the bars had been closed uh, for the World's Fair. The 19, was it 1964 World's 64, Fair? 64, 65. Yeah, uh, that was the time that, uh, what's his name, Wagner had closed down the gay bars. So there were not a lot of gay bars. and. Uh, Gay bars, it's interesting, the restaurants had less of a problem than the bars. And why this is so, I'm not quite sure about. If you just mentioned why um, um, Mayor Wagner closed down the bars during... Yeah, well, he, his feeling was he did not want tourists to, uh, by accident, end up in a queer bar. So he started closing down the bars. Uh, and uh, I came to New York in August of 66, and they were still having raids. I mean, they're still having raids, they're still having entrapment. Uh, I was involved in a raid uh, in a bar that was in Midtown. When I, uh, I had just moved to New York maybe about maybe six weeks after I was there, and uh, there was a raid in the bar, and I managed to get out f through a back door. Uh, that didn't bother me, strangely enough. <laughs> I mean, the, you know, it was like someone said, oh my God, you're in a raid in a bar. But it really, I just thought, well, this is just part of the whole, you know, fucked up quality of New York at this point. I mean, with, uh, like I said, uh, it was a much harder edged place to be in than certainly San Francisco. Uh, and I, I, when I, you know, the, the guys that I met, they kind of uh, reflected that. Oh God! Okay. Do you remember the the bar? Yes, or? yes. Talk about that. Uh, the bar was uh, in Midtown. There were some bars in Midtown, uh, and I think it was called something to do with the Raven, like the Black Raven. There were there was what was called the Bird Circuit bars. Uh, most people, certainly who are younger than, than me, don't understand the Bird Circuit, but bars used to. Uh, sort of uh, project what they were by their names. And an underground uh, a code was that gay bars often had bird names, like, uh, like the three, they'd be called something like the three parrots, or the black bird, or the black raven. Uh, and uh, there, was, uh, there were a bunch of bars that had these bird names, so they were called the bird circuit. And the bird bars were usually in Midtown. They were often, uh, West 56th Street had a number of them. Uh, the bar that I, uh, that I remember, I think it was on 59th Street. It was fairly close to Central Park. And what was uh, interesting was, uh, I believe there was dancing in the back, but you went through a, uh, a front bar area and then there was a back area and you had to go like be sort of admitted to the back area by a bouncer and I was admitted into the back area and uh, they had tables and there was dancing and it was very dark dark lighting and there was a commotion going on in the front of the bar and uh, I was gonna leave and the bouncer said don't leave and uh, because they're raiding the front of the bar. So 
uh, I like I was, you know, like I said, I was barely 19, and I, but the idea of being arrested in a bar raid when I had no money was just too terrifying. So I found a back door and left uh, with another guy. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I rem what I remember most of all was it's pouring rain, and we ended up in an alley because uh, the, those blocks uh, in Midtown often had alleys, uh, and we were in an alley, and we just managed to get out of there. Uh, but uh, the kind of the personal implication of that was a little bit beyond me. I mean, like. There are, I found out later on that there are a huge number of gay men who would never go to bars because they were so scared of raids. But the idea that, uh, you know, the, what had happened to me, I just thought, well, this is just another aspect of New York. I, you know, uh, it didn't, uh, uh, didn't bother me that much. There were other aspects of New York that bothered me more. Yeah. So let's bring it then back to Stonewall. Yes. Um, and somebody else who I interviewed said, yeah. That's, he was in another bar and somebody came in and said, the queens are rioting, the queens are rioting. I wonder if it's the same guy running from bar to yeah. bar saying yeah. this. Yeah. Oh, you mean at Julius's. He said the, the girls had, uh, the girls are rioting at, uh, at, at Stonewall. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if this guy had been at Julius's who yeah. gave me this yeah. other story. Yeah. Somebody came in and said, the queens are rioting, the, the queens, queens are rioting. Are rioting. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, it, so you had it on over and if you yeah. could just... Yeah. Go into it even more. Well, I mean, I, by the time I got there, it was much later. It was probably like one or about one o'clock, and like I said, it it was it looked like a um, uh, almost like a theater set in the fact that the cops had brought out riot lights. There was a huge amount of light. There was a lot of glass on the street. Uh, lots of cops in riot gear. Uh, Lots of people are milling around. Lots of people milling around. Uh, I, th yeah, I can't remember if that was the first or the second night, uh, to tell you the truth. Uh, but uh, what I what I do remember mostly about that, uh, and I, I'd like to tell this story, is that I was extremely happy. I was really, really happy that this had happened. Uh, I was so sick of the. Uh, the uh, complacency of so many queers in New York uh, that, you know, this is the way things are and they're always going to be this way and uh, you have to be careful and you have to, you can never trust anybody and you don't know what's going on. And, and I hear these stories all the time. And the fact that someone uh, the, had actually rebelled really made me very, very happy. Uh, and uh, I remember. Uh, uh, that summer, uh, actually it wasn't the summer, but a couple of weeks uh, after Stonewall, maybe it was in August after Stonewall, uh, I was driving back uh, from Reese Park. Uh, Reese Park was the gay beach in, in the city uh, with this friend of mine who was a uh, kind of uh, much more well-heeled guy. Uh, he'd gone to Harvard, his family had money, he was a young man, maybe five years older than I was, and he was just absolutely aghast at what had happened. And he said to me, the girl should never have done that. We have our own bars, we have our own beaches, we've got Fire Island. You know, they're just making a bad name for us. I mean, the, the press is saying these bad things about us. I mean, people just think you know, that we're just a bunch of street queens. And, and I said, thank, I actually said to him, I said, thank God someone is really rebelling. And we cease being friends. We cease being friends after that. Uh, yeah. So, uh, how I got into GLF, I mean, that, uh, what had happened was GLF started having dances to make money uh, very soon after they were, uh, they were organized. I think they started organizing probably by August. Uh, so they started having dances at a place called Alternate U. And I don't know if you know about Alternate University. Uh, alternate university was a, a, a very countercultural thing. Uh, it took up the, an entire floor of a building on Sixth Avenue and Fourteenth Street that had uh, a it had a dance studio under it. So it was this 
very big space. I'm not sure exactly how they afforded it, uh, but they had uh, classes there, and you could take classes in things that were uh, really practical, uh, like I think they, they offered like accounting classes. Uh, they offered a lot of, of political classes, like you could uh, take a course in Marxism, you could take a course in organizing. Uh, and uh, so they started having uh, dances there, GLF did. And So I started going to the dances. I went to about maybe three of the dances. Uh, and then, so I started talking to people about the Gay Liberation Front. And I said, well, I'd like to go to a meeting. So I went to a meeting. They had meetings on Sunday nights at a church in Chelsea called Holy Apostles Church. Uh, that's uh, on uh, 28th Street and 8th Avenue. It was almost across, in fact, it's still there. The church is still there. It's across the street from the Chelsea Clinic. And uh, I went to my first meeting, and uh, I was just enthralled. I mean, I'd never been to anything like this. Uh, we broke up into small groups to, like, talk to each other. Uh, uh, I met, you know, like probably 40 people. Uh, that night, and I'd never been in a situation where you could actually meet gay people uh, in a non-sexual, uh, non-competitive, uh, relaxed, but intelligent way. Uh, and uh, I went out afterwards with, with several of the... Uh, Oh, well, good. <laughs> I went out later with several of the, the people I met, so, uh, at least uh, it was like one guy, maybe two women, and we went out and had coffee in the village, uh, which you could do then easily. Uh, and would just talk for I mean, hours, and uh, I, I, I had no real leftist political consciousness. I mean, uh, I had to be, you know, uh, informed or educated about, you know, how, uh, how capitalism, patriarchy, sexism, and homophobia are related to each other. And People did that. I mean, like people were very happy to share their, you know, their political knowledge with me, their ideas with me, uh, their whole thing with me. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to do was I knew they had a newspaper, and I had been writing. Uh, I'd written a novel. I'd been writing. Uh, I'd completed a novel. Uh, I had been writing poetry. I'd been writing short stories. And people kept telling me, you'll never be able to get any of this published. The only way you'll be able to get any of this published is if you change the males, half the male characters to female characters. Give them female names and you can get them published. And I didn't want to do that. Uh, and so they had a newspaper and I, saw, I immediately went to work with the newspaper. And the, the first issue that I was involved with, which I think was the third issue, uh, they published two poems of mine under the name Mark Shield. Uh, I used a pseudonym for the, the poetry, but my name appeared on the masthead. I wanted to have my name on the masthead. And then after that issue, uh, I never used a pseudonym again. And uh, Why was there one the first time? I was just too shy. I was simply too shy. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, one of my GLF brothers told me, uh, uh, his name is... Uh, Nikos Diamond, I'm sorry, his name is Nikos Diamond. And uh, Nikos is uh, kind of, he, li he still lives in San Francisco. He's been in San Francisco. He was part of that, uh, the, the GLF diaspora that moved to San Francisco uh, 
by about 1973. But anyway, Nikos told me, he said, he said that there had been many scholars who had approached him and wanted to know who Mark Shield was. <laughs> you know, and Nikos wow. had forgotten that I was Mark Shield. <laughs> so uh, I think that's a funny story. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, I, w I was uh, very happy to be working on the paper. Uh, at that point, the paper was, uh, was, was put out by a collective, the, the Come Out Collective, and there were two women on the paper who, as I always say, they were more collective than anybody else. They really ran the paper, uh, and uh, I had a difficult time with one of them. Uh, uh, her name was Lois Hart, and uh, Lois uh, was this kind of strident lesbian who really disliked men, and she had a difficult time in GLF. She didn't stay in GLF that long. Uh, but uh, my uh, second uh, issue of the paper that I worked with, I, I wrote a piece about cruising, and I wanted to call the piece uh, Cruising uh, colon, games men play. And it was going to be a political analysis of cruising. And it was. Uh, and uh, Lois did not like the idea, well, first she didn't like the idea of devoting this much of the, uh, of the paper, uh, this much ink, to male, male cruising, which she thought was just, not, uh, you know, uh, was uh, not political enough, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but she decided that, it, that the title just basically did not castigate men enough. So she insisted that I uh, change the title to Cruising, colon, Games Male Chauvinists Play. <laughs> so uh, the, the, uh, the piece was, became very popular, and it was reprinted in maybe six anthologies. I mean, it, it really got out there under Cruising, Games <laughs> Male Chauvinists Play. And I, 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 to this day, people say, you know, for, or anyway, for years, people say, so you wrote that piece on cruising? And I'd feel almost embarrassed because I did not, that, that term to put male chauvinist there was not in my vocabulary. It was not something that I would have done. I didn't feel that way. I didn't feel that, I didn't feel uh, that I wanted to castigate men that way. I, I had a much more sympathetic attitude towards gay men. Uh, and I, and I almost always do. Uh, I, I think that growing up the way I did in the South uh, and seeing uh, so much violence around me in the South, uh, that to me gay men, I've always, I've always felt that they, they're much more uh, uh, capable of nobility and uh, They, they really have a, uh, uh, a depth of feeling that uh, our stupid culture tries so hard to repress. Uh, so uh, the fact that this piece, <laughs> Cruising, <laughs> Games Male Chauvinist Play, was like my first big splash in the movement, <laughs> you know, it's, I still find it kind of amusing. If you would like to, as we just agreed, uh, talk more about the structure of GLF, the yes. activism, the yes. personalities, however you want to describe yes. it. Well, uh, GLF was uh, uh, organized around cells, and each cell was like an autonomous group within GLF, and the fact that each cell uh, kind of dictated its own terms and what it did uh, as a part of the, the larger group. Uh, but uh, what really kind of uh, nourished me through GLF was that we also had families. And these were kind of like affinity groups uh, of our cliques within the organization. And I, be I quickly belonged to one. And uh, my group had about six, six guys in it. And uh, they were just wonderful. I mean, uh, they gave me uh, this sense of belonging and emotional nourishment that I needed. Uh, and there was, I mean, 
there was strife with NGLF. I mean, uh, it was a you know, radical political organization. And when you have this kind of radical politics, you always have the, you know, more radical than thou, more virtuous than thou uh, crap. And, uh, and I really went through that uh, because uh, I became uh, so involved with the newspaper. And then the last three issues of the newspaper were published out of my apartment in Hell's Kitchen. And uh, the reason why, there, why this happened was that uh, the, uh, uh, actually Ellen Broidy, when you were talking about Ellen Broidy, you were gonna talk to her, uh, she and her partner uh, had an apartment in the East Village and they uh, gave one room over to the newspaper. And they decided that they needed that room back and uh, I was kind of confronted uh, with this idea that if I did not bring the newspaper to my apartment and start publishing out of my apartment, the newspaper would fold just like that. And I said, I, I didn't want this to happen. And I had never published a newspaper. I knew very, very little about it. I loved the paper itself. So I just said, okay, then we'll bring the paper over to my apartment. And uh, uh, several of the women who'd been on the paper at that point dropped off also. Uh, like I said, one of them was uh, Lois, Lois Hart. Uh, she had a, a partner named Suzanne Bevere who did a lot of the, the graphics for it. And both of them dropped out of GLF. They decided GLF was too male dominated. Uh, so uh, we published the last three issues out of my apartment. And uh, at, this, at that point, uh, I started getting a lot of pressure from other groups uh, to let them uh, basically commandeer sections of the newspaper. In other words, they would, we would, the, the collective that produced the newspaper would give, let's say, a quarter or a third of the newspaper over to a group who would, they would, they would uh, have control of it and, uh, uh, but we would, the collective would produce it and sell it. And, uh, what would be, what other groups? Yes. Uh, well, one of them was called Third World Gay Revolution, and it was a third world group, and the other one was, uh, The other one was the famous star, Street Transvestites Action Revolution, which was uh, supposedly the first transgender group uh, maybe in America. Uh, and uh, it was basically street drag queens, but you know, we now say transgender. It was the first transgender group in America. And a lot of, a lot of those, a lot of the girls were, you know, certainly uh, uh, taking hormones and uh, were transitioning you know, as much as they could back then. Uh, and they, they wanted to commandeer parts of the paper. And I felt that this was just not right, that the collective should still keep the paper. If they wanted to join the collective, fine. Uh, and this became really controversial. I mean, uh, the uh, Third World Gay Revolution uh, people, they uh, branded me as a racist. They said, you know, if, if you don't let us do what we want to do, you are a racist. Uh, and uh, that pissed me off. Uh, the, uh, the star girls uh, threatened that uh, if they couldn't have their part of the paper, that they would start attacking newsstands in the West Village that sold the paper and burn the newsstands. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's a different time. Huh? Yes, of course it's a different time. Yes. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I was pretty steely. I just decided that I was not going to let this happen. And the, the other people who were on the collective did not want this to happen either. Uh, we wanted the paper to have a genuine professionalism that we would bring to it. Uh, and if we had done what they wanted, uh, it, it would have just lacked that. It would have just lacked that. I mean, if, if they wanted to, you know, to run pieces in the paper, fine. But they wanted to just take over a certain part of the paper that we would then produce for them. Uh, so uh, we, 
I went through the, that kind of strife. It was very difficult for me. I mean, it was really hard to go through that uh, and still feel really good about GLF because I did. I still had a huge love for the organization. What was what was the difference between Gay Liberation Front and um, Third World Gay Revolution? Well, the Third World Gay Revolution was a a kind of like a group within GLF, uh, like we they were a cell, uh, and uh, they produced uh, some pamphlets. They had some meetings, and then they broke up. They broke up fairly quickly. Uh, Star. Uh, became really controversial. Uh, a lot of the women dropped out of GLF because of Star. They uh, could not deal with the drag queens. They thought the drag queens were anti-female, that they were simply aping women. Uh, and uh, they, uh, the, the kind of dishiness of the, of, the, of the drag queens bothered them because often they would call each other miss this and miss that and miss thing and miss that. and the. The, the lesbians did not like that. But you have to see that all of this was going on while the organization was still doing a lot of political, political actions. I mean, we were still involved with marches and demonstrations. Uh, we were involved in uh, May, the May Day in Washington, a uh, huge demonstration in Washington. Uh, there was something called Gay May Day, so a lot of GLF people went down there for Gay May Day. Uh, what was the May Day March in Washington uh, about? It was huge. Uh, shit. <laughs> uh. Is this a second rush hour? Yeah, it must be. Well, see, we also have um, uh, Amtrak trains. So we're talking about yes. the May Day but, yes. demonstration. Uh, it was a it was a huge demonstration. Uh, it was a national demonstration. Uh, for against against the war. Yeah, it was called May Day in Washington. Uh, I think one hundred seventy five thousand people were involved. I, I think about 175,000 people were involved. The idea of it was to shut down the Capitol. And uh, they had uh, uh, people uh, who were like uh, shutting down the bridges, like they were, you know, keeping traffic off the bridges, keeping traffic off streets, uh, uh, in front of the Capitol. Uh, and it, uh, I believe it was in. Uh, in May of 72. I think it was in May of 72. Uh, but there was a bi this was one of the first times there was a really big, active national gay contingent. I mean, you had people coming in from, San, from the West Coast, from San Francisco, from GLF in San Francisco, GLF in LA. Uh, there was GLF in Texas sent people. Uh, the New York GLF was there. The Boston GLF was there. Uh, God, I think there was a GLF in Ann Arbor, Michigan. They sent people. Uh, so there were uh, maybe, uh, I would say about 500 gays and lesbians were there. Uh, and we had our own area, our own, uh, we were in tents. And we had our own area, our own tenting area, somewhere near the National Mall. Uh, so uh, a lot of people were arrested. Uh, I was not arrested, but several of my GLF brothers were arrested. Actually, a, a 
good number, probably, that I knew of, probably six or seven were arrested, just of the guys that I knew. Uh, again, it was like, uh, I was so fucking poor that the idea of being arrested in Washington was just too scary for me. Uh, so uh, I tried not to be arrested. But I mean, I was involved with it. Uh, and uh, the cops were horrible. I mean, they were really awful. Uh, uh, I mean, they were like, you know, we used to say breaking skulls. I mean, they were really breaking skulls. I mean, people were, uh, were really hurt. Uh, I think that uh, it was a, uh, a real uh, watershed moment in the anti-war movement. How? Uh, that you could have that many people coming into Washington, not just to demonstrate, but to actually shut down the city and the... Washington was really aware of it. I mean, Washington became really aware of it. Uh, uh, there's been a lot written about May Day. Uh, you know, I mean, actually, a couple of books have come out about it. Uh, and I know that I've been interviewed before about it. Uh, yeah. And bringing this back to um, your, your consciousness about the Vietnam War and your consciousness of um, the oppression against gays, and you mentioned uh, patriarchy and everything before. Could you build that up just a little bit more? Just um, um, how, what, what set GLF apart, perhaps, from um, the Gay Activist Alliance, for instance, yes. ideologically? Yes. How about that? that? That's a very good question. I, I like that. Um, uh, what set GLF apart from GAA was a very simple was very simple very uh, it was the idea that gay liberation and there was a concept of gay liberation uh, this is something that people have a hard time getting their heads around because uh, people say well wasn't Mattachine involved with gay liberation no they were not they were part of the homophile movement uh, uh, they wanted to be tolerated gay liberation uh, said that the oppression of queer people was part of all the oppressions that happen in society, that we are a part of the greater oppression that goes on, that we're a part of oppression against uh, people of color, against uh, women, against children, against all people in an oppressed situation, and that uh, gays and lesbians are oppressed. You know, let's just get this out in the open. We are oppressed. So, uh, uh, for a lot of, we used to have this wonderful term, a lot of dra what we call dragon faggots, <laughs> a lot of older queers hated this. I mean, how can we be oppressed? We live on the Upper East Side. We're somewhere in Fire Island in the Hamptons. How can we be oppressed? And my feeling was, oh yes, you're somewhere in Fire Island in the Hamptons, but you can't even get a, a table at a fucking restaurant if four of you walk in. You are oppressed. I mean, I, I knew how oppressed we were. I knew how open to attack we were. I knew how what it had done to our our, our heads, uh, and uh, uh, this was all su such an organic part of GLF because of consciousness raising. Uh, the, you know that uh, one of the things that GLF did was uh, we all everyone in GLF had to belong to a CR group, uh, and the CR groups would stay together. You know, for years. I mean, like I was in a, a GLFCR group that stayed together for about two years. What CR? Consciousness raising. Yeah. So I mean, that's this this process of consciousness raising. Uh, that's what produced this understanding of how oppressed you were. You know, had to be open about yourself. Uh, what GLF stood for was a was a basic integrity and uh, authenticity, and. Uh, some of GAA, uh, some of my brothers in GAA were very close to that. I mean, like, they, they were really very much in, involved with that. And some of them were, I think, as radical as the people in GLF. Uh, 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 Arthur Evans, uh, who was one of the, the pillars of, of GAA, I mean, I think he was as radical as anybody was in GLF. But uh, GAA wanted to go through things in a much more rational and the GLF people thought male 
structure. They had a hierarchical structure. You know, they had a president, a vice president. They had voting. They had rallies. You know, like to who was going to become president. Uh, they had an inner inner core of people who directed the organization with almost no women involved. Whereas uh, GLF had no hierarchy. Uh, we tried very hard to have gender parity. Uh, uh, that was difficult because uh, no matter how uh, much gender parity we had, there was still the matter of the gay women versus the gay men and uh, the fact that gay men have, as just being men, have been trained to be leaders. And it was very hard for women to be leaders. They weren't trained to be leaders. So you, you had that, uh, that uh, tension there. Uh, and uh, with the, uh, the, the gay women, their, their, their thing was, we will get together as women in a women's environment, in a, a, a women's space, in a woman's space, and they formed a group called Radical Lesbians, which eventually became completely autonomous and left GLF. And by that time, uh, there, was, uh, there was a real lack of women in GLF. There were still maybe about 10 of them who, who stayed on, but so many of the women had left. Uh, but we also had other groups that were more political. Uh, there was a, a cell called uh, a Red Butterfly that were Marxist. Uh, and uh, there was a, another group uh, that were Maoists, which I always thought was fucking funny. I thought, Jesus, you know, Mao would, <laughs> Mao would probably go out and kill all of us. But they were really Maoists, uh, you know. And they, they got to be... What I always found so funny about them was that uh, some of the most obviously bourgeois people in GLF belonged to the, the Maoist group, uh, and uh, you know, naturally, naturally. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the leaders of the Maoist group um, uh, was uh, a guy named who, who recently died. His name was Bob Bland, and uh, Bob went on to become a democratic operative an operative for the Democratic Party. Uh, and I thought, you know, to go from Maoism to a Democratic operative, uh, he did that. Uh, and, and not that I have anything against what he did. I mean, you know, we all you know, grow up. But I just found that uh, uh, he once uh, described me as uh, uh, one of the most bourgeois people uh, in GLF because I like reading, I like classical music. <laughs> but he's a Maoist. He's that's a Maoist. So that, you know, that was the Cultural Revolution. Yes, exactly. Was, you know, you're an elitist because right. you're thinking. Right, exactly. 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 Yeah. Um, they, they would wave the little red book. Oh, God, that fucking little red book. They'd wave the little red book at you. And they would quote the little red book. I thought, you people, I mean, Jesus, I mean... I mean, Mao would come along. He he would come along and decimate you all. I mean, you know, it's like that red waving the little red book. Well, farewell, my concubine hadn't come out yet, yeah. so they weren't able to reflect on that from a gay point of yeah, view. Yeah, really. Which came out what I guess twenty years later. Yes, so maybe even right. sooner. Um, if you'd also talk about um, the first march yes. and the Central Park being yes, yes, uh, I can't remember. Probably it happened around April of uh, 69. But uh, what had happened was uh, Craig Rodwell, who owned Oscar Wilde Bookstore, he had this idea that there should be a march to commemorate Stonewall. Uh, and uh, he wanted to call it Christopher Street Liberation Day, uh, the Christopher Street Liberation Day March. So he spoke to Bob Kohler. I think that's how it happened. And Bob Kohler was this older guy who was like one of the uh, GLF pillars. Uh, Bob was a lightning rod of dissension. There are people who really dislike uh, Bob because he was aligned with the drag queens, with the star girls, not with the women. The women often did not like Bob, although he tried to like them. But he was an older guy. I mean, when I say older, at this point, he was... I was uh, maybe 23, and he was like uh, 45 or 46. Uh, most of the GLF kids were, I mean, most of the people there were really young. I mean, I, I was 22 when I joined, I had just turned 22 when I joined GLF. 
and most of the people involved with it were uh, either like five or six years older than I was or even make a year or so younger than I was. It shows you how young the organization was. Uh, so anyway, he, uh, Bob uh, uh, brought the idea to, uh, to a GLF meeting and uh, there was uh, a lot of dissension from the women. The, the women said, well, uh, suppose the bars take it over and they start having floats and go-go boys on it. And uh, Bob said, we won't allow that to happen. Uh, this is going to be a political march. It'll be all about that. Uh, uh, we will not allow the, the mafia bars to get involved with it. There will be no floats. There will be no go-go boys. Uh, and uh, uh, that first June, uh, we had a week-long celebration of the Stonewall Rebellion. So it wasn't just the march. Uh, we had uh, GLF-sponsored uh, 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 some panels, uh, some, uh, there was some dances, uh, some, uh, uh, we had some jargon word for classes then. I can't remember what the jargon word was for classes, but it was about gay liberation. You know, we were going to talk about ourselves. Rap groups? I'm sorry? Rap groups? No, it was a little bit more uh, like information forums or something like that. We had some information forums. Uh, And uh, I got involved with uh, kind of like the basic organizing of the situation uh, uh, because they needed people to just do a lot of scut work too. Uh, we had a food committee uh, that prepared meals for hundreds of people. Uh, I mean like most of it was like brown rice and peanuts and stuff like that. But, it was, I mean, but we were feeding people because people came in from all over. It was again a situation of people came in from Boston, uh, people came in from the Midwest, from the South, I think there were some people from Atlanta came in. I don't think they came in from the, from the West Coast for the first march. Uh, and then uh, some people uh, were, uh, they took martial do, uh, training, martial training, they became marshals for it. Uh, and uh, on the day of the march, there was this uh, I don't know if you, if you know about this story, we still had not received a, uh, a permit. And there was this question, uh, would we be arrested for doing the march? I found out later on that we actually had received the permit. Uh, there had been a, a committee for the march, and uh, the committee, and I think uh, Bob Kohler was certainly part of that committee, uh, but uh, they had received the permit, but it was really late. It was like the day before, the night before the march they got the permit. The permit had to come from the police department and they finally got the permit. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, we were going up 6th Avenue to uh, Central Park and that was, that was a weird thing too because 6th uh, Avenue goes downtown. Mm -hmm. So they had to clear off one lane of 6th Avenue to get us, you know, up to uh, the park. And uh, at a certain point, I can't remember exactly where I was, it might have been around uh, about 53rd or 54th Street, maybe even 55th Street, the word got out that the cops were going to start arresting people. Now why this was going to happen, I can't remember, I'm not sure that people started literally running into the park. And the last couple of blocks, it was like people were just dashing into the park. Uh, you did, we did have marshals who kept uh, that lane open, that lane of traffic open so that we could march. And there were about 5,000 people marching. Uh, yeah. What did it feel like to march in that first Kind of fabulous and scary. 
you know, it was just fabulous and scary. Uh, I loved it. I mean, the idea of being out there with 5,000 other people who were my, you know, gay brothers and sisters, I loved it. Uh, it was, uh, I mean, uh, for years afterwards, when I would march in the, in the parade or even watch it, you know, I would just start instantly crying. I mean, it was like, it just took me right back to that. Uh, it was wonderful. And then we, we got into uh, the Sheep's Meadow, and the, the question was, so what do we do now? I mean, we had no speakers set up. There was no stage set up. There was no rally set up. So people just decided, okay, we'll, uh, we'll have a be-in or a gay-in, and, uh, and that's what they did. And it was just amazing. I saw all these friends of mine there, and all my GLF brothers and sisters were there, and, uh, and we were very, very happy. Uh, and uh, it was like a, it was like a, uh, an affirmation of who we were. Could you just describe a little bit about what a be in or an in of any yes. sort was at that time? Yes. Well, th that was very popular. This is all idea of the be ins and the, the love ins and, and all these kind of things. And it was basically a uh, kind of uh, uh, sort of a structure without a whole lot of structure. I mean, you're there together to do something. Uh, and uh, the be in structure was simply that you're just simply there to be yourself. And uh, of course, if you're hip enough and hot enough and wild enough and crazy enough, that's all you've got to do. Uh, with the gay end thing, it was that for a lot of guys and probably some of the, the girls too, it meant for the first time we could show affection in Central Park openly. And this is what happened. You know, I mean, like suddenly you'd see guys kissing in Central Park, which you could never see before, certainly not in the Sheep's Meadow. Uh, you might have seen it maybe at night in the Rambles, but you wouldn't see it openly in the Sheep's Meadow. Uh, so that was that was that that was kind of amazing to us. I mean, here were all these gay people. I mean, openly in Central Park in the in the in the Sheep's Meadow, uh, acting you know as queer as they wanted to be. I mean, holding hands and kissing and and uh, some of them were doing circle dances and you know snaking around with holding hands and snaking around and. And they were like, you know, uh, 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 men and women together, and uh, uh, and it was marvelous. And it went on for a couple of hours, and then it sort of, you know, people just left. Uh, but afterwards, uh, one of the things that GLF talked about, uh, and we had a meeting afterwards to talk about it, was like we really should have planned something. We should have used this, you know, as a political uh, uh, platform. We should have done something. Uh, we did hand out flyers, there were flyers, uh, and I still remember the flyers. The flyers were so wonderful. Uh, the flyers uh, said, you know, uh, this is a march uh, by of gay people uh, to commemorate uh, the Stonewall, I think we call it the Stonewall riots, to commemorate the Stonewall riots. And we, uh, we it said something like, uh, you may laugh if you want to, but we are serious about ourselves. And that's what really struck me. Uh, the other thing, another thing that really struck me was uh, one of our GLF brothers was this marvelous guy named Jerry Hoos, who unfortunately died about uh, three or four years ago of stomach cancer. Uh, and uh, Jerry was uh, one of the marshals. And I still remember Jerry, uh, I was marching near Jerry, and Jerry shouting at the marches, you're not in the dark anymore. You're not in a dark bar look proud and I thought that was so great that was just so wonderful yeah uh, how did it seem to you that was there a sense that the gay scene or the gay community such mm -hmm. that it was was visibly different one year after than it would have been like before oh, Stonewall? oh 100 percent 100 percent could you talk about oh that? just uh, it was like there was a community, a real community. It was really happening. Uh, there was this uh, 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 Walt Whitman had this wonderful term for uh, male uh, closeness, uh, queer closeness. He couldn't use that word. He said he called it adhesion, or, or men who, who basically queer men would be close to each other and 
support each other. And that was what was going on. There was adhesion. Uh, and uh, the most marvelous thing about the adhesion was that it was based emotionally, not sexually. It really was. I mean, I had uh, incredible numbers, of, an incredible number of guys I was very, very close to uh, who were not my lovers, but I really loved them and I was very close to them. Uh, and that came out of the GLF experience. And uh, uh, during that year between the riots and uh, the first march, uh, we really got to experience that. I mean, just to you know, really experience that. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, it was. I I still feel that way about it. I have very positive feelings about my GLF experience. Uh, there were bad things about it too. I mean, there were and, and, and emotionally, it was like being put through a a, a you know a, a potato grater uh, because uh, you, well, you you not only had the fact that. Uh, uh, I was, you know, uh, this shy southerner uh, now out, uh, and that uh, uh, my my telephone number was printed in and come out as the come out telephone number. I get all these crazy calls from people and, and from the police. Uh, uh, you not only had that, but you also had the dissension within the organization, uh, and uh, uh, me feeling like. Uh, because I had not come from a political background, there were people who were so much more political than I was and that they were way ahead of me politically. Uh, and uh, uh, people were attacking each other. There, were, there was this, uh, some people were attacking each other. And uh, I would get attacked sometimes. Uh, and uh, I hated that. It was very difficult. Uh, I had a, I would say a real breakdown afterwards. Uh, that happened uh, when I was uh, about 24. Yeah, uh, and uh, I just suddenly caved in, you know, from all the the pressure and the tension. And I found out later on that a lot of my GLF friends did. A lot of them did. Uh, and uh, I, I do know about one guy who, unfortunately, did kill himself. But he. Uh, had moved to San Francisco after GLF and, and killed himself there. And I, I don't know if he did this because of the experience of GLF or because of uh, going to San Francisco was just uh, that difficult for him. Well, I have uh, very positive feelings about GLF, about that period of my life. Uh, it was extremely formative for me. I mean, really formative. Uh, it was like, for the first time in my life, I had what I felt like was a family, ever. I mean, before that, uh, my mother had an extended family in the South, and I always felt like I was just pretending my way through it. God, was I. Uh, here I had these people who were, you know, ostensibly strangers who were my brothers and sisters, and I felt closer to them than I'd ever felt to any members of my family. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, a lot of the men have died. I mean, too many of the men died of AIDS, uh, and it's, that's a heartbreak to me. Uh, but it was like this, for this, this three years that I was involved with GLF, and it was about three years, it's that I had this, this incredibly embracing family. And, uh, I know that uh, other people who've been in GLF feel, feel the same way. I mean, some of them do. They certainly feel the same way. But I, I, I always say that uh, uh, I have no feelings about uh, the schools that I've been to. I, I went to NYU and have a degree from NYU. Uh, but, but I have no interest in going to a, an NYU reunion. Uh, my, my high school was... I, they keep inviting me to high school reunions, <laughs> and I've never even wanted to go to one of those. But uh, when GLF has a reunion, I, I mean, I want to be there. And uh, the closeness I have to these people, it's just, uh, it's really just kind of remarkable. I mean, uh, we really 
are a family to each other. I, and like in a family, you know, there, you have, there are people, there are aunts and uncles and cousins you may not particularly like. I mean, some of them are people. Uh, although at this point in our lives, I mean, we're all so much older that uh, th that's mostly worn off. That is mostly just worn off. Uh, but uh, it, it's just hard, it's just hard to even uh, uh, to communicate what that meant at that period of my life. It really did change me. It made me feel uh, much more confident about myself, and uh, I could claim my own feelings. That I could claim these feelings, uh, this desire to be authentic, this desire to be close. I could claim those feelings. Uh, as far as and uh, you know, you're talking about consciousness. So much of my consciousness does come still from GLF. It still comes from that period. Uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, GLF really inculcated in us was this realization that uh, there are, there's oppression that goes on and that's going to continue going on as because of the way that power works. And this oppression will set up various formats and patterns of behavior and uh, try and, and surfaces and facades, uh, and we certainly see that in government now. We see that in society now. It just keeps coming back, but that there is an authentic an authenticity to humanity that must rise above it, and that was really a GLF uh, concept, and I'm very very pleased of that concept. I really am. Uh, as for uh, As for the, this idea of the evolution of gay consciousness, uh, my feeling about that is that uh, it's really still happening, that there is still a real evolution of gay consciousness going on. And I've been in contact with, certainly with other men and some women who are still involved with this. And that despite all the bullshit about post-gay and mainstreaming and the uh, just alienating aspect of our consumerist culture that uh, wants everyone to believe that uh, we are all the same, but we're not. Uh, and that, uh, you know, as long as you can afford a Lexus, you know, everything's going to be all right. That uh, beside that, there are still these basic drives and hungers and feelings. And uh, so much of that directly goes to what is the queer aspect of life? Uh, that uh, for, to me, I've finally realized uh, that uh, the, uh, the, the, the whole basis of what we would now call gayness is simply who is going to save your life? And for gay men, that means other gay men or another man, or somebody else who's going to come in there and realize what you are about as a gay man. Who is going to save your life? And uh, this has uh, spiritual and religious aspects to it. Uh, it has uh, political aspects to it, and maybe even, even economic aspects to it. But uh, this is the most nourishing aspect of of this culture, uh, and I, I still think that this is that it's very important. I think that uh, uh, so many people. I mean, like I, I still have people who say to me, well, "Are you still doing all this gay stuff? I mean, why are you still doing this?" You know, uh, uh, I don't have a lot of them, but they still do that uh, anyway. Uh, it's because, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there's always that question, who is going to save your life? And in a certain way, it may be myself understanding my own gay life. Do you feel the current gay environment is living up to that as well as it could be? No. No. Why not? Uh, 
Uh, it's too scary. I think we still want, uh, now uh, people still want to uh, invoke uh, consumerism, entertainment values. Uh, the, I mean, like, there are all these slick magazines out now, like uh, one of them one's called Metro Source that just shows us as being super consumers. Uh, we're super consumers of entertainment, uh, super consumers of, of uh, fashion, of, you know, uh, home design, stuff like that. and. I, I find that really terrible because uh, a whole lot of young people swallow that and then they, they end up feeling really empty and cynical and resentful and uh, hurt. And I think that's very dangerous. I really do. I think it's very bad for young people. As a writer, uh, a writer is supposed to, go, to get deeper. I mean, that's what writing is about. It's got to get deeper. And uh, you have so many young people who they don't read anymore. Uh, they think that all the information they have has got to either come off the internet or come out of pop culture. And I think, God, I mean, that is, that is just, uh, that's almost dangerous. I mean, that's not going to really feed you. It's happening at society at large and it's happening at the gay community yes. as a, yes. a category within that. Yes. Um, how do you view um, same-sex equality, gay marriage? Um, was that a triumph? Uh, you mean there's another kind? <laughs> well, you know, there, there had been some of the thinking at the time was, um, you know... Um, when people ask me, how do you, what do you think of gay marriage? I always say, do you, th you mean there's another kind? Well, I did start out with same-sex, but, <laughs> right. Um, what do I think? Mean, just, you know, the idea at a certain point, certainly uh, among a lot of people, was that uh, marriage is a corrupt institution. It is. It is. But the thing is, I'm also very practical. I am a Virgo. And uh, I realize that, uh, what is it? There's something like 613 benefits that you get by being married. I think that's, that's the number. Uh, and if you're not married, you don't get these benefits. So why shouldn't we have these benefits? Uh, I think they're very good, and I also I also have always been in favor of uh, gay relationships that are complicated enough that you can't break up that easily. Uh, you know, like uh, when I was young, uh, there was no reason for gay men uh, to stay together, and you had these constant situations of men breaking up and breaking up, and, and then trying to find the next love of their life and going out and cruising to find the next one and they break up. So this adds a complication to the relationship which means that you have to really get deeper and work harder at it. And I like that. Uh, huh. Yeah, I mean, I, I like that. But the other thing that, that's very important and that we're missing out on is that the community also needs to take care of single people. I mean, really single people who are facing their age and you know, and their their death even alone. And I have a lot of single friends, and, and things are really tough for them. And there needs to be a lot more taking care of them, uh, not just by the community, but also by the whole society. Agreed. Um, any questions I didn't ask? Anything else you'd like to say? Uh, well, I would just like to say that I'm very grateful that we're doing this and that I, I'm really happy that I've gotten to talk more about the Gay Liberation Front and about, uh, about you know, GLF and what it meant to me and also how important that year was after Stonewall. Mm -hmm. That uh, uh, that was, I described it, that was the fissionable year. It was like, you know, it was like this atomic blast went off in that year after Stonewall. I mean, it changed so many people's lives. And then the year after that, even more so. And the year after that, even more so. So that uh, one of the questions I have been asked often in interviews is, why has the LGBT movement become one of the biggest international social movements in the world? And it really is. I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to comprehend how big our movement has become. And the movement really came from GLF and GAA. I mean, we gave birth to this movement. And uh, one of the things that I didn't bring up 
was why did we get so forgotten so fast? And I really believe that was because when we went into that 180 degree right wing, rightward swing in 1980 with Reagan, the corporatized, what had become the corporatized gay movement at that point, really wanted to forget about this ragtag group of socialists and commies who formed the Gay Liberation Front. They just wanted to forget about us and they started to resurrect the uh, glories of the Mattachine Society. And if the Mattachine Society had, had only been that group of, of basically men, the whole gay movement would have ended up with like 60 white guys in a room. So uh, it did come from us and people are finally starting to understand this. They're starting to really, you know, be a be interested in what we did and study us because uh, it's a fascinating story. It's a really amazing story. Cut. Okay. That was wonderful. Oh.